Well, good morning, church family. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Come on. Did you hear? Jesus is alive. He is alive, and he's alive in you. He's alive in me. And aren't you excited today that we have life because of Christ? Come on, one more time. Let's just give him a cheer today. Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you've done for us. And thank you for worshiping with us today. Why don't we give a big shout to the OC, our online campus. We hope you guys feel the energy we feel here in this room, right there in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you are. If you're listening later by podcast, thanks for, for tuning in. We're so excited that you are here. Well, today we are going to start a new topic. We're going to start a, a new series, a new topic today that I'm just, got to be honest with you, I'm super excited about. And it fits so perfectly into what we've been talking about our year, our theme for this year, which is the one degree. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking our relationship with Christ to that next level, our commitment to this community of believers and, you know, and, and sharing the gospel with the world around us that so desperately needs it, a world that is lost without Christ. And we're, we're taking our passion and our energy that one degree to the boiling point, aren't we, church? This is the year for that. And so this series that we're going to talk about for the next few weeks fits right perfectly with that. And I believe it also helps us walk right into the much more that we're believing God for this year in 2024. God has done so much. He's so faithful. There's so much more that he wants to do. And so we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about being born again. And today we're going to begin with the idea of, of thresholds. So if you'll just join with me in faith today, I'm going to talk just briefly because I want to leave some time at the end of the day to pray with you. So just join me right now in prayer. Let's just prepare our hearts to receive from the Holy Spirit today. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to speak directly to us. Holy Spirit, speak directly to me right now through this message, through this word. God, we just are so grateful for all you've done for us. And we, we cannot count the blessings. They're too numerous. But we can be grateful. We can show our gratitude. And so we prepare our hearts today to receive the word. Just say this with me. My heart is open. My mind is open. My ears are open. And I'm focused, ready to receive the seed of the Word of God so it can produce a harvest in my life. You believe that today? So open with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 1. And, and this is a part of the, of the Easter story. These are some days leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. There was a man, his name was Nicodemus. He was a religious ruler. He had a lot of authority and a lot of clout in the community. And uh, meeting Jesus and Jesus coming on the scene sort of wrecked his reality. And so we pick up in John chapter 3 here in verse 1 in a meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus. Here's what it says. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Our staff uh, have, here at FLC, we've been leaning in 
to this word this year, kind of exploring what it means. And this word is, is threshold, threshold. And threshold by definition is the point at which everything changes. It's a, a point of no return. It's a point that brings dramatically new conditions. And I'm in faith today that this message is going to be a threshold for many of us here on the campus watching online or listening later. This is going to be a, a threshold moment. And the simplest visual that I can give you of thresholds, and I don't want us to not sort of lose the, the context of the point or the power of the point with, with this example, because, you know, the example I'm going to use here could feel a little bit flowery and fluffy, but I ensure you that thresholds is not just a flowery and fluffy topic. It is a powerful topic. But the best visual I can give you of thresholds and being born again is the butterfly. A butterfly is born a caterpillar. Now the caterpillar stage is the most vulnerable and dangerous stage of the butterfly's life. The caterpillar stage lasts around two to five weeks. And then that caterpillar does a major metamorphosis and goes into the cocoon stage. And the cocoon stage lasts about one to two weeks. And then the butterfly emerges out of the cocoon. And the last stage is the butterfly stage. And the butterfly stage usually lasts somewhere up to around two months, about the lifespan once it becomes a butterfly. But the emergence of the butterfly is the threshold. It is the point at which everything changes. It is the point of no return, of no going back. And it's the point at which there are dramatically new conditions. So a caterpillar, for example, if it were to crawl continuously for its entire life, the caterpillar, if it's crawled nonstop, could crawl about 12 miles. Compare that to what we know about some species of butterflies that actually are known to migrate up to 2,500 miles. Here's a caterpillar that on its best day, in its best life, in its best two, three week span, is gonna cover about 12 miles. That becomes a butterfly that can migrate literally nearly around the world. So from mobility to beauty, we don't really write many songs about the beauty of a caterpillar. But we do talk about the beauty of a butterfly. Those caterpillars are not ugly. They're, they're beautiful in their own way. But it's the butterfly that we praise and talk about the most of being beautiful. So from mobility to beauty, the change is dramatic and it's permanent. Everything changes once it crosses that threshold. But I want you to consider this important fact. I want you to hear this very clearly. Consider this important fact about the caterpillar and the butterfly. As dramatic as the change may be from caterpillar to butterfly and where it can go and how it can travel and what it looks like and how it behaves, as dramatic as that change can be, it's so important to recognize that the caterpillar and the butterfly are the same insect. It's the same insect. All that changed was its ability. All that changed was its potential. All that changed was its power. All that changed was its influence. It's the same insect. Listen to this. One was born, and the other was born again. Thresholds. I want to read to you a quick excerpt from the book that I released this past year, talking about thresholds in our own journey as humans. 
Because every one of us goes through a metamorphosis. Every one of us goes through a major change on a threshold. And here's what chapter two talking about canvas says. If we live into our 80s, childhood represents just a fraction of our life. Yet it is thought to be responsible for forming nearly our entire palette of values. The images imprinted on our minds develop into portraits from which we make our decisions, pursue our careers, lead our families, and live out our days. Everything that is said and felt while the shutter of childhood is open molds our lens on life, our worldview, and how we see ourselves in that world. What we believe about relationships, work ethic, how we should treat one another, fairness, equality, family, justice, rules, and success. What we believe about love, nurture, compassion, survival, belonging, and most importantly, what we believe about God, who he is, who we are, eternity, morality, right and wrong, is all burned onto the film of our minds in this brief and potent era we call childhood. So from the moment that you and I are formed, there are experiences and influences that are literally shaping our mindset. The majority of these voices are grounded in emotions, and they're grounded in sort of the things that we feel with our senses. So conversations and, and interactions are being packed into our perspective. And so by the time we hit our 13th birth, thir birthday, most of what we believe in and who we are and our lens on life, our library of values and beliefs and convictions is, is set in stone. And what's worth noting is that it's known that the most potent of this time frame is the first three years of our lives. From birth to three years old, meaning no other era in our life will have the impact birth to three years old has on forming and shaping who we are. Now imagine that. Imagine that the most, most powerful era of our develop is the stage of our lives over which we have the least control. Nothing will imprint upon us like those first three years, and we get to choose none of it. Humanly speaking, we don't get that window back. So maybe for some of us, we look back on that era, that window, and we say it was great, and it, and it seemed very healthy. For others of us, we might say it was slightly out of whack and uh, could have been a little bit better. And then there are those of us that recognize it was chaotic. It was abusive. It was toxic. And our individual experiences can be incredibly different, vastly different. But here's something that we all share in common, is that this window has a profound impact on who we are, how we see the world, and how we see ourselves existing in that world. And here's another fact concerning that stage that's true for all of us. And listen carefully. Some of it is worth holding on to. And some of it is essential that we let go of. For example, in my own experience, when I was just a young kid, my sister pinned me to the ground. She refused to let me up, and as I struggled to get free, she compassionately looked me in the face and asked me, do you want up? And I thought, here's a glimmer of hope. She's finally going to release me, and through my tears, I cried, yes, I want up! And then she grimaced a sinister smile and she said, then get up. <laughs> Debbie, if you're watching, I just want you to know, <laughs> I forgive you. It's not worth holding on to. Guys, bitterness is not worth holding on to. Unforgiveness is not worth holding on to, but then there are some things that are worth holding on to, like forgiveness, or like hearing my dad pray, hearing my mom say to me, son, be strong and courageous. Parents, listen to me. Will you 
you follow God with all your heart. You give your kids something to hold on to. When you bring them to the house of God to worship together, you give them something worth holding on to. So there are parts of our reality that are worth holding on to, and there are parts of our reality that is, it is essential to let go of. In fact, I believe a, a healthy, powerful life, the life that God intends for us, the life that He's designed for us, depends on it and comes from knowing what we should receive and what we should resist. Wholeness, health, happiness, healing, the good life, the God life, depends on not receiving what we should resist and not resisting what we should receive. Now, the first time that we are born, especially in those first three years, we are incapable of making those kinds of decisions ourselves. And we might try to not receive, we might try to resist, and we might try to receive some things in our lives, but we're at the mercy of our influencers. We're at the mercy of our environments. And so as a result, what can happen is as we grow up, it can be really hard to discern what we should receive and what we should resist. We can become confused about these things and so we end up taking on things that we should have resisted and we end up missing things that we should have received and this I believe is where we find Nicodemus now some of the teaching and the traditions that he grew up with the ideas that were impressed upon him as a a young child and then a young man moving into the religious society, some of the things that he heard and, and believed, as right and religious as they may have seemed, when he encountered Christ, they became an irritation to him. And I believe that irritation, that, that, that irritation was his instinct and his training and his position saying, resist Jesus. Resist him as the Messiah. Resist his, 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 all of it, everything inside of him was saying, resist, but his spirit was saying, receive. And it created a tension in his heart that he could not resolve. And that urge was so strong in Nicodemus, a religious leader, so strong in him, that under the cover of night, he comes to meet with Jesus. And Jesus says, the only way, listen closely to what Jesus is saying, the only way you will ever see me for who I am, that you'll receive salvation and know the fullness of the kingdom. Now listen, the only way for us to clearly see the kingdom, to fully understand what Christ has done for us, the, the only way to push past the emotional, feelings-based perspective of God, to find truth and wholeness, is to have our minds and our hearts reshaped and reformed. It's the only, only way. Jesus says, Nicodemus, the reason you are struggling to see me for who I am is because your spiritual eyes have been clouded. You've been taught some things that you're gonna have to relearn. You built some habits that you're gonna have to rebuild. You have some ideas that are gonna need to be rethought. Your view of God needs renovated. You need to go back to the most formative years of your life when you were moldable, when everything was new. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I believe this is the message the Holy Spirit has put on my heart for this Resurrection Sunday is that we must be born again. We can't carry all that we've been trained to believe and see, especially the stuff that's not been based in the Word of God, that's been based in human experience, and allow it to redefine who God is. No, we must have our thinking reshaped, 
reformed. We must be born again. Because there are ideas that have been deposited into your thinking and my thinking about God. About who we are. About who we are in Him that need to be reconditioned. That we need to surrender to God. And the only way that can happen is to be born again. And here's some good news for all of us today is that we can be born again. We can be born again. And the the powerful part is that this time we get to participate in what we will receive and what we will resist. The first time through, we didn't get to participate in that. We had no choice in the matter. But this time, we get to participate in what we will receive and what we will, will resist. And being born again begins by receiving Jesus. Maybe for the first time, as your rescuer, you receive Christ today, as your rescuer. And maybe you've already received him as your rescuer, but you've resisted him as your renewer. See, because Jesus doesn't want to just save us, he wants to change us. And just because you might have received him as your savior doesn't mean you've received him as your changer. So you may have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, but be resisting him as your renewer. And just like the first time we were born, being born again means that we get to learn to walk again. Only this time we get to learn to walk by faith. We get to learn to talk again. Only this time we get to learn to talk the word of God. We get to learn a new language, the language of the Holy Spirit. We get to redefine our worth. We get to let go of the hurt. We get to hang on to the hope. We get to have our minds renewed. We need to get our spirits renewed. We get to have our hope restored. We get to have our purpose re-energized. We get to rediscover the kingdom of God. And so just like Nicodemus, we come today. And we have to admit that in our self-righteousness, our self-righteousness means nothing in the presence of God. Nicodemus was, was far more educated about the Bible, far more knowledgeable about the laws of God than really anybody around him. He was a scholar. He knew what he was talking about. He was an authority. He had studied the Word of God. Nicodemus knew far more about the law and the Torah and the Word of God than probably all of us in this room together. And yet, in all of his righteous knowledge, in all of his knowledge of who he thought God was, in all of his knowledge of how the law worked and and all the feasts and all the the traditions that needed to be followed and, and all the things, in all of that, even Nicodemus needed to be born again. And if Nicodemus needed to be born again, I need to be born again. I need to go back to the former things. I need to go back and allow the Holy Spirit to reshape my thinking, reshape my perspective, rebuild my faith in God to help take out the things that don't belong that are essential for me to let go of and show me the things that are essential to hang on to. I've got to be born again. Nicodemus needed it, we need it. I'm not above being born again. And I believe Jesus offers us hope in this. Well, Pastor, what does it mean to be born again? What it means to be born again is to say, God, I surrender myself to you fully and completely. I recognize my need for you as my rescuer, but not just my rescuer, as my renewer. Not just as the one who's brought me out of darkness, but one who's going to teach me to walk in the light. 